are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host Ashley Case, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Karina Ames. Karina is experienced in winning work for engineering consultancies and currently leads Arup's infrastructure pursuit and bidding team in Australasia. She previously worked as a private investigator and with Victorian government. Karina holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Melbourne, a PMP Foundation certification, and was a 2019 APMP 40 under 40 winner. She has been a APMP ANZ committee member since 2016 and the chapter chair since 2019. This year, the APMP ANZ chapter won the 2020 Stephen P. Shipley Chapter of the Year Award. Wow. Welcome, Karina, to Scribble Talk. Great to have Thanks you. very much. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Hi, it's a pleasure, Karina. And now let's go back to the very beginning, as you always do. Talk us through about where were you born and your high school and education. Sure. Uh, so I, I grew up in the Yarra Valley in Victoria. So I was born around there and it's a lovely scenic winery region. So it was a, quite a lovely place to grow up. I uh, went to a primary school just around the bend of it, a Yarra River um, bend with mountains in the background and um, went to the high school connected with that school in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne later on. Yeah. And then went to Melbourne University. And I, I chose Melbourne University because of the beautiful buildings <laughs> um, that, were, that were there. So wanted to do law for a while, but um, in the end uh, did arts, which is kind of the opposite degree, and um, specialised in creative writing as, as my major. Oh, wow. So from arts, what brought you into engineering consultancy? Uh, it's kind of funny that my, there's a lot of engineers in my family and, uh, you know, from my great-grandfather down, there's been a lot of engineers, but I was um, just temping for an engineering company when I was in Darwin on a working holiday, okay. which is up, up the, the north of Australia. Mm. And someone handed me a bid and said, can you write that? And I said, I'll have a go. And like most people, I fell into the profession through that conversation. Oh, wow. Was that uh, interim job, a temporary job? Was it first job after university, Karina? Or... No, no. So I had um, been a private investigator first. I'd done that for a few years and actually held my licence for about 10 years on, and did work in, in holidays and that sort of thing. So private investigation was the family business. Both of my parents are investigators and uh, that's where I started my career. Uh, in the end, I decided to go with my passion, which is writing, and I wanted a career built on that. Mm. And bidding just, just came at the right moment to, to do that. Wow. What does private investigators do? They, <laughs> they do all sorts of things. So there's two key streams. So one is surveillance, and one is what we call circumstance investigation, which is interviewing people and writing reports. Uh, so I, I did the second, I did circumstance investigations, not surveillance, and mostly because I've got really bad eyesight. Um, I have trouble recognising faces and I get lost easily. I've got a terrible sense of direction. So I wasn't a very good spy, um, but I could interview people and, and write reports. So I did, I did that element of it. Well, you just remind me of James Bond, Karina. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. No, it's not quite that glamorous. It's mostly, um, it was mostly insurance work. So um, assessing claims for insurance companies. And it's, it used to be quite um, dirty and dangerous. It used to be able to do what, what we called pretext calls, where just say someone had made an insurance claim, you would give them a call and say, hey, your, your claim's been settled, um, pretending to be their lawyer or someone, and then they'd come out and build a new driveway and you wouldn't have to pay them anything. Um, but it's, it's quite sanitised. It's quite a, a very upfront industry now and... It's not, not as glamorous as it sounds, but what I did enjoy was meeting people from all walks of life. I'd, one day I'd be on a building site sitting on a milk crate with my laptop perched on my knee, and the next day I could be in a really fancy office. So I really loved meeting different, all sorts of different people from different backgrounds. Oh, kind of like you do here as well. <laughs> 100%, Karina. 
I know. I do you have any memorable or interesting experience of you know, or maybe a funny experience, anything around your ten year of private investigating career? Um, it was kind of concurrent with my bidding career for most of that. Oh, nice. I guess um, I guess a location was memorable. One, the main firm I worked for in Melbourne was situated in this this house that, that you had to access via a cobblestone laneway through a back entrance and a security door. Mm. Um, and driving past the main street of that house, you would never know that there was a PI firm there. It was very well hidden. Uh, so yeah, I think it was it was quite quite an experience. I, I ended up leading a team who were investigating car accidents. So not really a pleasant um, kind of kind of environment. There was a lot of um, you know terrible stories of people whose lives had been shattered. And I think it, it basically got too much for me at one point. It was just like it's a very dark subject to be looking at day in, day out. Um, but yeah, I did meet a lot of interesting people, former policemen who had, um, who had very interesting spy careers in the police force and then came out into this industry. So very colourful characters in, in that industry. Got you. I think you should speak to Gareth Ail in the APMP UK chapter. Yeah. Um, because Gareth's, uh, Gareth's PhD was in, was in Elizabethan espionage. Oh wow! Uh, and yeah, and uh, yeah, so yeah, he's into spying and other things. But part of uh, <laughs> part of studying as well. So you will go hand on hand. Two chats, yeah. UK and Australia. Let's talk about spying in the next podcast. You know, it'll be fun. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so you are now part of the you know bidding environment. And how long have you been in the bidding proposal industry now, Karina? I think directly around uh, 13, 14 years, but I had a stint in the Victorian government for working for a project mm-hmm. in country of Victoria where I did communications and stakeholder engagement. So that was a little bit, I think um, one of my industry colleagues refers to that as my country holiday. Um, so around, um, yeah, I think it was roughly 13 to 14 years of directly relevant experience. Got you, got you. I think my my mentor in the public sector procurement, Professor Gary Sturgis, he used to be cabinet secretary of the Victorian government. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I even recorded a podcast of him. It's a long podcast. It's two hours. Wow. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll forward you the link after that. I think anybody who's into, he's the kind of the de facto authority globally. Um, for a public sector commissioning, as he called. You know, he, he, he even difference between procurement, commissioning, outsourcing, you name it, and <laughs> how people get muddled just because you use the word contracting or outsourcing or procurement. They all are different and mm. different people assume they're all the same and they use the same vehicle. And it's pretty fascinating. You know, I'll, uh, I'll maybe have that link in this episode. So <clears throat> listen Lovely, to thank you. That. that's great. So 13, 14 years of proposal career and now leading Arup's infrastructure pursuit and bidding team in Australasia. Uh, can you talk us through about your latest role and uh, any kind of uh, latest memories? Sure. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I lead Arup's team of infrastructure bids. So I've actually got three teams in Australasia. Wow. One's consulting, one's buildings and one's infrastructure. Um, I, we do work quite globally at Arup, so there's a single profit and loss type management set up. So we, we're very integrated with our UK colleagues and our US colleagues. Um, but I've got a really great team. There's, there's some very um, young and keen people on the team and it's just amazing seeing them uh, grow day after day and take on new challenges. So I really love that element of my current role in terms of bringing up the next generation of, of passionate bidders and um, supporting them in that, in that growth as well. Wow, that's brilliant. In your career, kind of, you might have done I don't know, maybe hundreds of proposals. Is there any proposal that stand out uh, that reminds you that, wow, we did that? Yeah, I think each proposal stands out for a different reason. One, one of my favourites was a, a bid when I worked for uh, WSP in, in Brisbane and we helped win an Australian first contract to bring European rail technology to Australia. Mm. So I was working with a great team and you know, some people that had, had, it, had it first not really um, seen the value in bidding mm. and having proposal professionals that ended up being great friends and 
just worked really hard together and, and put everything into that. A really good pursuit phase first, and then the bid itself. And I think we went through a three or four stage bidding process. Um, and we won. So it was it was a great bid for all the right reasons, great people, uh, really well well planned prior to the, the bid documents coming out. A challenging bid process and then a win at the end. So that was that was one that stands out to me as something I was really proud to be part of as well. Oh dear. And because you work in engineering and construction, is there any buildings that you are that the projects that you worked out that you're super proud of, or, or is there anything that you want to share? Uh, not so much buildings. I generally do with bids for roads and rail and, right. and that sort of um, infrastructure. I have done a lot in the water space as well. So there were a few, um, the Victorian desalination plant bid when I worked for GHC. That was another really, really intense bid process. And um, it was another learning curve for me. I think it was around the time that alliances started becoming really big in Australia. Yes. So merging with other companies as one team and, and putting a great offer forward. Um, but yeah, that was another really great one to, to address a key need, although it was a controversial um, technology and project, it was really needed when Victoria was in drought. So um, I guess that's probably as close to a building as I've got, <laughs> apart from, um, you know, adjacent rail stations and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's mostly been in, in transport related defence, water and um, whatever main market I've, I've dealt with. Yes, that's good, uh, Karina. So, before we move into APMP and a little bit more about other elements, Karina, tell us three things not many people know about you. Oh, okay. Um, I, I have my open water license for scuba diving, which I, I did once on the Great Barrier Reef and I haven't, haven't really dived again. So um, that was quite fun. We had a terrifying instructor when we did a night dive. He said that um, if a shark approached, we should all just group in a circle and put our tank to the to the back to protect us from sharks. Wow. I think he was half joking, but that was quite quite nerve wracking at the time. Mm. Um, I've also jumped out of a plane, so I did a tandem skydive, and I would never do that again. I, I value my life too much. Um, I, don't, I don't know how people are looking it up there again. I think the scariest part was um, just the when the others dived before me, and the plane shook really really badly. So that was mm. um, quite terrifying. Mm. Um, probably one I haven't really shared before is that um, my, my parents were also missionaries and, and when um, I was quite young we went to the Philippines and I spent about a month uh, living in Dubao in, in, near Mindanao and also visited a, a tribe in the hills outside of that town as well. So it was very remote and the, we were given a hut, um, a family vacated their hut for us so that we could stay there. But, it was just a beautiful experience to have as a young a young woman, I guess, in terms of seeing how happy and beautiful the people there were when they really didn't have many material possessions. So I think that was a really formative moment in in deciding what was important to me in life, and it was a really great learning experience. Wow, we will touch all about that in in round three, Karina. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Karina, APMP. So uh, how did you come across APMP and when did you become a member of APMP? I think it was around the time about the first conference in Australia. So look, thinking back 2000, uh, it would be before 16, 15. I can't actually recall the date of that first conference, which I should know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just such an amazing moment. To see. There's, a whole, there's a whole group of people who do what I do and um, understand and we can have a conversation as we get each other. So it was a really great find and um, yeah, I just wanted to get involved straight away because I was so happy that this group of people existed. <laughs> and uh, do you have, after 2015 APMP Australian Conference, do you have any other memorable conference? Oh, all of them have been. I've been, I've been involved in the um, conference planning the last couple and I think our last one, it just had such an amazing atmosphere. There was just this, um, it's kind of like a sense of relief or group therapy when, when people in Australia get together to talk bidding from APMP. There's, there's this amazing energy and generosity of sharing ideas and, and um, tools and techniques that come together. So they've all been quite fulfilling from that perspective. Brilliant. So uh, 
you have been the chair for the past one year, Karina. I mean, like you know, being a member on its own, it's a different league. But uh, why did you choose to become part of the board? And what was your um, maybe your vision for APMP NZ as a chair? Yes, um, I um, joined the committee, I think it was 2016, and I sat on that for a while and helped um, plan our networking events. Yep. So I worked with quite a few volunteers, and it was really good to hear directly from the membership base what they were looking for and, and what how we could add value. Mm. And I guess I had some ideas, and um, our chair at the time was, was departing it after a certain time, so I just put, put my hand up and said, I'd like to give it a go. Uh, I really do like leadership. I, I like driving things and seeing results. And the way I like to do that is through just empowering the portfolio owners within our committee to really play to their strengths and follow their passions and sort of take a, not backseat driving, but a sort of um, uh, an approach to leadership where I can support them and help them in that space. So, uh, yeah, it's been nearly two years um, as chair, and I've really enjoyed it. I, I think what we're trying to do is take the global brand that is APMP, but also tailor it for the ANZ region, region and parts of Asia mm. um, that we also work in where no chapter exists. Mm. And one of the aspects of that is, is trying to be thought leaders and, and um, bring some really good value to our members through things like a salary survey we've got underway, some programs we've introduced and could just keep reassessing what we're doing and make sure that it continues to add the most value. Brilliant, brilliant. And uh, I knew Rick was raving about <laughs> the last <laughs> year's APMP ANZ conference and uh, you know, he had some positive memories around it. But I, I, I briefly uh, joined the BIDEX virtual conference that APMP ANZ <laughs> did today as it uh, mm. last month or was, was it early? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah last yeah. month. Uh, how, was, how was the effort, like the behind the scenes, virtu- uh, organizing a virtual conference, making them, uh, making people on and also during, before and after the conference, if you can share some stories, that'd be great. Yeah, look, I think it was definitely a learning curve for us. It, it came in a time where the, the bidding workload in Australia has been completely full on. Um, so look, I didn't do much of the work. It was really Andrea Ambrosio who leads our webinars and Mark, Mark Wiley, who was our conference chair. Mm. And they did the bulk of it with quite a few others involved. Um, I think it, it went okay. There was a little bit of a technical glitch at one time, um, but the speakers were really generous in, in joining us at all hours or through the recording. And uh, I've spoken with a few members and they've said they really got a lot out of it. So something we'll probably try again. And I know the, um, the UK VidX is on tonight. We we actually came up with, with the, the same name different, like separately without actually discussing with each other. So that was, that was um, quite funny. But, yeah, I think it went well. But, yeah, it definitely was a lot of work to try and um, make that technology work for us. Definitely. I think trying something new. COVID has actually accelerated the adoption of all the creativity and the new way of, ways of working, which we have been thinking for a very long time, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So, you know, everyone, the moment I say APMP ANZ chapter, one person named pops up is Nigel Dennis, as you can imagine. <laughs> yes, it does. Everybody know Nigel. And I was so happy, blessed to have him part of podcast as well as a special 50th episode guest. So uh, mm. uh, what's your experience? When did you meet Nigel first? And if you have any interesting memories of Nigel, maybe you could drop it here. Yeah, so I did, I did warn him that I'd be talking about him. So uh, <laughs> I did, did let him know. Look, so Nigel's fantastic. He's um, I call him Mr. APMP in Australia. He's um, he started the chapter and he's he's just so generous with his time to APMP. We didn't get along at first when we first met. So um, you know, imagine Nigel. He's very experienced. Very you know, he's been around for a long time, and suddenly this fairly opinionated woman comes up and starts challenging a lot of things <laughs> on committee meetings and on um, conference subcommittee meetings. So had a few um, really robust discussions at first, but we, we, I think we really respect each other and I've learned a lot from Nigel and really um, lent on him as the chair um, of the chapter as well in this role. So yeah, Nigel's fantastic. Oh, and is Nigel still part of the board, Karina? Yeah, definitely. He's he's he still um, oversees the certification program for us, and 
he's the main provider um, of the certification process in, in Australia, but he, he donates a lot of his time to help people pass um, APMP certification. Yes. Um, and he's also, he also lends a hand on, on other programs and conferences as well. So he's very active in, in um, the ANZO chapter. Wow, well, I can imagine, I can imagine. So he's one of my inspirations as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, and I knew, you know, we, we touched about APMP and your role as a chair and other things. So uh, you also contributed yourself to the bid and proposal community recently. Um, do you have any memories of sharing your own thought process, either in presentations or webinars or anything like that? Yeah, like, uh, so I participated in W. BBE, and it was quite intimidating uh, pre-recording something for a global audience. I think <laughs> I, was, I, don't, I don't know if others found that challenging, but it was. I found it a little bit intimidating. Uh, so I've, I've sort of hosted events at conferences before, but I haven't actually shared my own material prior to that. So that was sort of uh, a way of dipping my toe in the water to see how I went presenting. Um, so look, it was good to be part of it. I think there's uh, there's obviously quite a lot um, going on online at the moment. So hopefully um, that you know the the event was a success for global. I think it was. And yeah, it was good to do. I, I mean, I would like to try and um, come to one of the US conferences and speak in person one day. I think that would be an amazing thing to do. Hundred percent, Karina. Hundred percent. So, any other final um, pointers or any other things that you want to share part of APMP ANZ before we loosen up and move to the nutters round? Sure. Um, look, we're just having a really exciting time. We're, we've, got a, we've got a period of growth for the industry in ANZ in Asia. I think businesses are starting to take bidding more seriously and they're starting to see the value of uh, proposal professionals, particularly with APMP um, certification and, and involvement in this region. So I think we're poised for growth. There's, there's quite a few different untapped markets and people who, who are just starting to hear about us and wanting to get involved. So watch this space, I would say, for APMP and Zoom. 100%, 100%. So <clears throat> let's move to the nutters round in honour of Howard Nutt. Used to be the random rapid fire questions. <laughs> So let's start with some of your hobbies. I knew you already touched some adventurous thing that you did, you know, shark, scuba diving, jumping out of the plane, and also heartwarming trip to Philippines. Um, yes. Are you, are you kind of a person, Karina, who kind of uh, super adventurous, or you just want to try something and then say, hey, I tried it? Probably just someone who wants to try something and have a good party story, I think. I don't. I like. I do like getting out of my comfort zone. So I, I mean, so last year I, I auditioned and was briefly in a play, for example. I hadn't I hadn't acted before, but I just like trying new things and um, making myself. You know, it sort of fuels creativity. I think I, I do write fiction, so just working and not doing much else doesn't really fuel that creativity. So yeah, I like trying things. Oh, wow. Is there any other things that you tried? Something. Oh. Yeah, well, the most recent one was a, a hip hop dance class with the Sydney Dance <laughs> Theatre Company, <laughs> and look, I, I'm sure I looked ridiculous. It was on, it was on, um, on Zoom, so I just, I just made sure no one could see me. Um, but yeah, that was that was quite fun. It was just a bit of you know something to alleviate the lock, lockdown boredom. But I wouldn't mind trying a different class um, in person once, once things unlock. And it just reminds me, I asked Nigel to play his trombone and you could do the whole dance <laughs> and I will sit and clap my hands, you know, it'll be fun. That's amazing. I so, think people would pay to see that. I think that's a good, a good idea. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so you did mention that you write, uh, you read and also write fiction, Karina. So mm. that's uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, like... Uh, uh, what was the first thing that you wrote or where did the inspiration came from? Yeah, I wrote um, a novel called Lake Warring and it's a, it's a literary murder mystery set at Lake Yildon in Victoria, which is this remote bushland type setting, mm. a little bit eerie, a little bit haunted. And I uh, haven't got published. I got very close with that manuscript to getting an agent in the UK and uh, was knocked back at the last minute. 
I think I've, I've been told a lot, a lot that literary fiction is not very commercially viable, so it's, it's um, quite difficult to get published. But I'm still very proud of the manuscript. I think I'll um, hopefully get it across the line one day. But I, I guess what inspires me are people's stories, but also the landscape. So Australia's got a very unique um, landscape and outdoor settings, and um, that particular lo- landscape really inspired me. It's, a, it's an old gold rush location with mine shafts all around. Um, but also the, it was previously it had a very big Indigenous population that lived there. So I was actually able to get in touch with one of the elders of the Torgorong tribe, um, an auntie, and get permission to use some of their language in the manuscript as well. So um, something I, I love doing, I think I just it's a, kind of a bug, uh, write, cr- writing and creative writing most writers, and I just, just can't help doing it. And when they, when they don't write, they're miserable. So it's um, definitely a passion for me. Wow. And um, I'm sure there are many more publishers. You could self-publish as well, Karina. Don't stop somebody telling you mm. hey, publish. I mean, like, you know, definitely you should try. Um, yeah. And you know what? I'm sure if any of the listeners who have any relationship with any publishing house or something, please, please reach out to Karina. <laughs> sure. I mean, like, that would be yeah, amazing. <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that. I think that's important. And um, yeah, I mean, let's let's touch one more. Um, how long have you been playing the piano or when did it start or do you still play? Yeah, so I, I um, played as a child and then took it up more as an adult. And I had this very, very heavy iron frame upright piano that I would drag from house to house as I moved. I had lived in a few different locations around Australia. So prior to my last move back to, back to Melbourne, um, I, I had to sell that and I bought a new portable digital keyboard that plays like a piano, but not quite. So that's that's what I play now. I just really play for enjoyment. I wouldn't say I'm a, a very good technical player, but uh, I do like playing and sort of singing along. It's, it's a good stress relief method as well. Right. Is there any song that you sing frequently that uh, brings some memories back? or? Uh... Yeah, I like most things like my call play. I think um, they're quite easy to play and, and sing at the same time. And they're just very a bit melancholy and a bit um, relaxing. So I do like Coldplay's music. Ah, nice. Oh, my God. I wish you, you know, there are so many hidden talents inside our APMP guests. And <laughs> we can all bring together in one of the Bitcoin or somewhere where instead of having entertainment, I think some of our APMP talents can play, you know, music, mm. sing, and, you know, there are so many, so many that they can do, even writers, as you all already said, because Larissa from South Africa, she 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 also writes. Um, How does she? Yeah, she writes fantasy oh. novels, so it's super. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think all these talents, and I'm partly part of this thing is for the podcast is how people realize that the people whom they know for a very long time, they have this alternate character. Or alternate <laughs> hidden, hidden secret. Hidden, hidden, hidden secret. Line. That's amazing. So let me add one more to the listeners. Where they'll be like, wow, look at this. Look at this woman. Oil <laughs> painting. <And> that's <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, um, look, I've, I've only fluked one really good painting. Some of, most of the others have been chucked out, but I, I painted the area that I grew up in in um, the Yarra Valley with some rolling hills and a vineyard in front of it. And I think it came, that particular painting came from the heart, so it was half decent. But um, when I've just tried to paint a subject and, and not really felt it, it hasn't been as good. So something I just dabble in, again, it's, I, you know, being a creative person, I just want to try different mediums and see what works for you. But yeah, I just have, I like having a go every now and then. Wow. So do you, do you normally share the art uh, in Instagram or, uh, or do you share that among your friends or do you, have you sold anything or is it just for your own family, friends? Um, you do that? My husband was, my husband was lovely and, and got that particular one framed. So that's just hanging in our lounge room. And um, yeah, the, I haven't really painted any others I've been happy to share. So that's, that's really just one. Um, at this point but yeah I, I'm not really a big Instagram person I think um, I'm probably I don't know it kind of annoys me Instagram but <laughs> no it's just something I just something I do for myself well that's interesting oh, you are already full on my god uh, let me add one at a time number one you are leading Arabs uh, pretty much the team for Australasia number two mm-hmm. you also chair APMP number three 
you are adventurous and you also even experiment including hop dance and then you read you write fiction you play the piano you do oil painting that's like seven yeah yeah i don't really sleep so <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a nine. I'm like, like, like Nigel Dennis. We, we're often uh, emailing, emailing each other late at night about APC, ANZ chapter business. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really like to sleep. I like to, to get as much out of life as I can. So it's not, it's not like I do every one of these things every day, but I do, I do like to do a lot. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, Karen. Now, please do, please do take your time and, you know, experiment, you know, go for life experience. It's beautiful. So, mm. Uh, outdoors uh, what's your favorite place that you have visited yeah I think it has to be Florence Falls in the Litchfield National Park in in Darwin in the Northern Territory so it's just this prehistoric location where you you can um, go down this very steep flight of stairs and you come out to this this pool and you can go swim, swimming in that and swim out under and then look up and see some amazing greenery above you while you're under the, while you're under this waterfall. Um, so I think that that place is very close to my heart. It's just a place that I, I love to visit and haven't been back to it for quite a while. But, I'd like to. but anything with mountains and waterfalls, really, I, I, I don't get out as much as I would like to. But when I did live in Queensland, I did a bit of um, hiking in the um, the Sunshine Coast hinterland, which is quite beautiful. Mullaney um, is a, another gorgeous location up in the mountains there. If I am visiting Australia, so mm. what are the top five kind of outdoor places that you recommend? Maybe you, you, listeners take a piece of paper. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think those two would have to be the top of the list. So you go to it. So none of the locals in Australia go to any of the tourist spots, you know, in, um, for example, in you, no one goes to Kakadu National Park when they live in Darwin, they go to Litchfield National Park and there's, there's a series of places there where you can see big termite mounds or you can see um, waterfalls or rivers within that park. Mm. So that would be one, and that would probably have five locations in that, in that place as well. The, um, again, the Sunshine Coast hinterlands are quite beautiful. They've just got, um, I don't know, just this magical nature to them. And, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, an Indigenous story about the mountains there, about a, a son turning his back on his mother when when a flood came and he, he got um, stuck in that position and his father's turned his face away from him and won't look at him. So there's these really interesting stories to the landscape as well. Um, look, I'd have to say the Yarra Valley as well. I'm a little bit biased. It's, um, it's beautiful with vineyards everywhere and on cold mornings you get this, this train of frost around the base of the mountains that you can see. Um, so within those three areas, I think there's quite a few locations that are, are worth visiting. Nice, definitely. So finally, um, rescue cats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk us through all about rescue cats, passion. Sure. Well, we don't have a lot. It's just, um, so we adopted a, a cat about a year ago. His name is His Royal Highness Prince Ashley. And we adopted a friend for him only a few months ago. And uh, her name is the Duchess Crumpet. Oh. So um, they keep us they keep us busy. So um, Prince Ashley is a Russian blue, and Crumpet is um, a bit of a mix, um, just house cat. Mm. But they um, they're very entertaining, and um, I, I'm a bit of a, a crazy person. I do what what you know what I like, and I, I sometimes take them for a walk in, in a, pr a pet pram mm. around the park and um, get a lot of attention, get a lot of um, lo lo big smiles from people as they see the cat in the pram. So. Yeah, they're they're um they're quite fun. Yes, and the name sounds very royal, Prince. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're very regal animals. They, they, I mean, they rule us. We we always had dogs, so we lost a um oh. we had a border collie cross Kelpie, and we lost her about three or four months ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, we got we got a second cat instead of dogs. We probably will get dogs again, but um, yeah, we've got two cats at the moment, so they keep they keep us quite busy while we run around and serve them. Nice. I think there is always this battle among the cast dogs or cats and <laughs> all yeah. the sports. Yeah. But uh, you have a neutral position there. That's nice. So, okay. Yeah. So, let's now officially enter the Nutters round. So, what one trait you like the most about yourself? 
Yeah. Um, I, th- I like the fact that I take risks. So I, I do um, like going out on a limb sometimes and, and leading the charge in a particular way. I don't really like living life conventionally. So, you know, I like if there's an opportunity to be grabbed or, or a different direction to try, I'll usually go in that direction. I think our listeners could have predicted that straight away. <laughs> considering. <what>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. <Fair> enough. <laughs> so what will you do if you have a time machine? Oh, I would love to go back and see one of Shakespeare's plays in the flesh at the time that were, they were first brought out. I think uh, I got to visit the Globe Theatre when I visited London and got the atmosphere of having a live play in, in that theatre and uh, with, the, uh, with a fellow. And, yeah, I think it, it would be amazing to see a live performance back then. 100%, 100%. If a genie granted you three wishes, what would they be? Hmm, that's a hard one. I think, uh, look, health overall for, for family and friends, I think health is such an important part of life. And if you don't have that, you can't really thrive in anything else so definitely help for family and friends would be amazing um well what do you wish for world peace maybe you know <laughs> and, and maybe to be let out of lockdown in in melbourne it sounds quite, quite full on at the moment here so you know cure for covid something along those lines yes i know you are a fiction author karina so if you were to write a book about yourself what would you name it Oh, wow. <laughs> well, like, like most people in leadership, I think I've got a bit of imposter syndrome. So the great pretender springs to mind. Yes. Um, but, but maybe um, the scribe, I'm not sure, something to do with, with loving the written word and writing. Uh, what was the title again, Karina? The, maybe the scribe. I can't, I can't really think of anything else at the moment. But the that, scribe. That'll do. The scribe <laughs> by Karina. Oh, it sounds good. It sounds good. So... You already mentioned, you know, what you jumped out of the plane and you said, I'm not going to try that again. Is there anything else that something you have tried that you'll never, ever try again? Um, yeah, probably on a more serious note, I've tried to uh, kind of fit into corporate politics within some of the firms I've worked for. And I've just decided I'm not very good at doing that. I'm, I'm very authentic and I don't really enjoy um, playing politics or trying to get ahead by pretending to be someone I'm not. So that's probably something I've decided later in my career. I'm just, it's just not for me. That's so true, Karina. At some point when we progress in our career, all you face is that, you know, and, uh, mm. and whatever that's been thought with you, you know, you just need to somehow maneuver that landscape, you know, bet on the right horse and hope that right yeah. horse was in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's tough. It's tough. So, but yeah, mm. well, you know, thanks. That's a brilliant, that's a brilliant message. So uh, what internet site do you surf to the most? Um, Realestate.com.au. So my, my husband and I owned a house in, in country Victoria at one point, but we've been renting and moving around a bit since then. So we're, we're at the point where we're saying we'd like to probably choose a place and stay put for a while. So, yeah, I love looking at real estate um, listings and, and, Deciding what life would be like in different locations with, uh, within Australia. Got you. Do you have plans to move elsewhere in, in near time or? Uh, not in the near future. I'm definitely around Melbourne, but uh, I am toying with the idea of moving closer to the beach because it's, it's quite nice in some of the areas um, near the beach in, in Victoria. So, yeah, I haven't decided yet, but just, just considering long-term plans. Nice. Yes. So if you could switch bodies with a certain celebrity, who would you switch and why? Right. Um, look, I'd, <laughs> that's an interesting one. I wouldn't really want to go for the model type. I think I'd want to, um, you know, maybe Tim Winton, who is one of my favourite Australian writers who writes about the landscape and also about the um, the redemption of people who have gone gone down the wrong way. So someone I really admire who campaigns for environmental protection and just an all-round good guy. So I'd probably switch with him. Oh, wow. Yes. So in Australia is, is, is a sporting country. Um, so if you could be an Olympic athlete or any sports athlete, in which sport would you compete? 
Well, surprisingly for my height and build, I was quite a fast runner when I was growing up. So I'd say um, sprinting. I was able to beat some very fast fast girls on the track when we were in primary school. So yeah, so um, probably that. I really enjoyed the rush of it. It was I was terrible at long distance, but um, sprinting was quite fun. Do you have any favorite sports that you watch? Uh, not really. I'm very unsporty for an Australian. It's, and I know it's sacrilege to say that. Uh, I, do, I do barrack for the Geelong Football Club. You, you have to have a club living in, in living in Victoria. Yes. Um, but no, like, I, mean, I, I like beautiful things. So things like ice skating, I like watching. If I'm actually going to sit down and watch a sport, something like that would appeal more. Yeah, that's interesting. So you did mention that you were a sprinter in primary school. What was your best subject in the primary school? Definitely English. So um, <laughs> I found out um, after later in life that the, the person who taught me to read was also doing a thesis on my reading abilities. And I think I got a lot of extra attention and um, just loved the written word, word from a really early age and had some great English teachers who encouraged me along the way as well. Wow, that's very interesting. So when you are having a bad day, what do you do to make yourself feel better? Um, <laughs> probably embarrassing for a podcast, but lately I've been dancing in my lounge room. So there's, 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 uh, there's not a lot I can do. I can't really, um, I mean, I do try and go for walks and, or go for a jog and go to the park. But, um, you know, if it's late at night, at night and past curfew, I, I put on a bit of David Guetta dance music and just turn the volume up and dance in my lounge room. That's it. That's it. I mean, like, you know, we don't need to wind down. I mean, like, that's, that's brilliant. Kind of. And how often does it happen? Morning, afternoon, evening? or uh, uh, no. Mostly mostly late at night. So I, I don't sleep a lot either, as I mentioned. I'm just a bit of a night owl. So, yeah, often at night. Not not too late. But, um, yeah, just probably 10 o'clock at night or something. I might rock out. 10 o'clock. <laughs> Let me set up the alarm. <laughs> <laughs> just, just as I feel, you know, just as the, the mood moves me. Oh, that's nice. Does your husband join you as well, or he'll be like, "What is she doing?" No, no, he's he's down in his. I generally don't don't. He doesn't like my dance music. He, he thinks it's a bit. He likes more, you know music with more integrity. <laughs> so yeah. Usually, just me. That's it. That's it. that's brilliant. So, if you could eat only three foods for the rest of your life, what food will you choose? Uh, chocolate would be top of the list. So have a bit of a chocolate addiction. I think a lot of people could, could relate to that. Yes. Um, thinking, I mean, anything chocolate, but can we have just three foods made out of chocolate? I think that would have to be. <laughs> I do actually, I do really like rice, which is it's a bit funny, but just by itself even. I, I really, I think um, when we went to the Philippines, I really liked the, the food. There's those fresh fish and rice and mango and uh, that sort of stuck with me. Um. Yeah, it's probably what I can think of, but I, I can't live without chocolate, so I think it's definitely there. Wow, I think you remind me of Chris Kalin, you know, the the, uh, <laughs> the colleague who is organizing the Bidden Proposal Summit now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the, hey, Chris, uh, we call Chris Mr. Chocolate, I mean, like... Oh, really? Uh, does, he, he, does he distribute chocolate to, to APP members? I think that's a... Every time he travels... Uh, he yeah. brings like two kilograms of Tamron and others uh, as wow. a price. So you better say him hello. So you never know. Uh, yeah, he, definitely. He's from Switzerland as well, right? So uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's part of their culture. But yeah, yeah we know. Mm. It's great. So um, let's see. What's the most interesting thing that you have read or seen this week or recently? Um, I think something along, uh, it's a bit of a serious topic, but on the Spanish flu and the, the um, similarities between the Spanish flu and coronavirus and um, the impact on the writing communities. So Ernest Hemingway and Virginia Woolf and some of their circle actually got the virus, the Spanish flu, and had ongoing health issues after that. So um, I guess just the, the reflection on history repeating itself and, and how that um, influences art and literature and you know popular culture afterwards 100 percent kind of this is the first time i'm hearing that actually mm. um, how specifically the writers got affected from that that's brilliant so uh, if you could be a cartoon character for a week who would you be uh, um 
Well, I've been, my husband's been re-watching every Simpson episode, so probably Marge Simpson. I think I've got that naive sort of uh, belief in everyone's goodness sometimes, and I think that's what I like about Marge. She's, she's a bit grumpy sometimes. I can relate to that as well. But, um, yeah, I think I'd have to go with Marge Simpson. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. What superpower would you most like to have? I think, uh, although I'm afraid of heights, I think I'd like to fly because just the ability to um, explore without restrictions and, and go anywhere I like, I think, I think that would be quite fun. So, yeah, flight would be good. Nice. What do you cook better than anyone? Uh, I don't want to say I can cook better than many people. I don't <laughs> think I'm a very good cook. Um, but my husband raves about my French toast. So that's probably the extent of my cooking repertoire. I, um, I do make good French toast. Nice. French toast is great. I love that. So uh, what's on your bucket list? Um, I'm making a lot of lists to, to, of things to do post lockdown. I think I mentioned before, I would like to try hip hop class in person, but Mostly I'm thinking about travel, probably because I'm not allowed to do it and I don't like being told I can't do something. So <laughs> I'm um, planning imaginary trips um, back to Europe with my husband and, uh, yeah, just thinking about all the places I'd like to see at some point um, on, on, a big, on a big trip somewhere. Yes. If someone made a movie of your life, would it be a drama, a comedy, a romantic comedy, an action film, or a science fiction? Oh, that's a hard one. Science fiction would be interesting. Hey, I wonder how that would apply. Um, oh, probably, probably a romantic comedy because I think they have a bit of drama thrown in, and they've also, um, you know, got my, been with my husband for ten years, and he's he's. Um, quite the rock of my life as well. So I think, I think that's probably the best one. Oh, wow. And who would you like to play the role of you and your husband? Um, maybe Winona Ryder. I don't know. We kind of look a little bit similar with the, the high forehead and the, the brunette style. Um, I mean, my husband has dabbled in acting, so he could play himself. I think it's, it's not, a, not a bad actor. But, yeah, probably, probably Winona. Nice. That's a good one. So if you turn into your partner for a day, what would you do? Everything my wife tells me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, no, I'm joking. Um, I think he's definitely really good with technology and understanding you know, current apps and pop culture and all of those sort of things. I'll probably try and learn um, a bit of that knowledge that he's got in his head around just to, how to make things work with technology. What, yeah. In your early uh, career, you were a private investigator. Do you had a special ally name for yourself? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I, I mean, I do, I do have leftover ticks around privacy and, and not wanting to share too much information sometimes. Um, so, um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a code name, unfortunately. I'll have to um, address that with my old employers. Yes, maybe speak to them, or maybe now you have a choice. Would you like to pick up a name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to. I have to give that some thought. No, I can't. Um, I can't really pick a name on the spot. But yeah, that would be quite fun. Yes, that's it. <clears throat> so who's the kindest person you know? Uh, I think it had to be my dad. I think he's um, not only was he a private investigator, but he was a, he's a minister and a missionary and just gives his life to help people. So that um, selflessness and kindness that comes through that, I think is quite inspiring. 100%. So who haven't you talked to you in long time and you hope that they're doing okay? Um, I've got some very close friends living in the UK and although we, we Skype occasionally and um, we chat on Facebook. It's quite, not quite the same as seeing them face to face. So I've got a very dear friend who's staying with her family in France at the moment and um, just trying to keep safe. And yeah, she's probably, she probably comes to mind. But we'd love to um, see some of these friends face to face. Yes. I, you know, we are in the COVID lockdown. Is there anything that you found observed lately that reminded you that people are kind? Um. 
I think just hearing of people looking out for elderly neighbours and relatives is um is something that is, has come out of this. I think, I've, I mean, it's been quite um, full on with, with some of the supermarket shelves going bare and people just trying to protect their own families, but some have been working to protect others in that space. And I think that that's a reminder of, of kindness. Just beautiful. What's the biggest lesson life has taught you so far? Um, I think probably be yourself and be authentic because, you know, we, we spend a lot of time at work and working towards professional goals. And the, the people that I admire most in the industry are really just themselves. They, they bring their whole self to work or to their home life. Um, and there's no in between, you know, what you see is what you get. And it's, it's, it's very much who they are. So being yourself and be, being authentic is quite important. That's brilliant. What's one kind or thoughtful thing someone did to you recently? Uh, someone sent me flowers this week. So I was able to help a former colleague out a little while ago and um, she sent me this beautiful bunch of Andean roses this week with a lovely card describing me as a North Star. So it was just very touching. It was um, maybe a little bit teary <laughs> to receive that. So that was quite lovely. That's brilliant. So what's the one thing that you want to say to and debunk that's been common in our proposal career? Sorry, something I'd like to debunk? Yes. Um, the, the idea that you can win a deal just with the proposal. Mm. So it's, it's most proposal professionals wouldn't buy into that, but mm. I still have people say, we need to put this bid in to get in front of the client and start a relationship. And uh, my response is, no, you don't. You've, you've got to go actually meet with them to start that relationship. So the idea that you can win something with a bid when you haven't done any homework or, or work leading up to that in the pursuit phase. Who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Um, Quite a, quite a lot. I've, I mean, working with the engineering companies, I've, I've met quite a few um, different people who have been really fantastic. So a previous um, an architect, female leader I, I worked with has been quite influential. Just She used to come to work um, dressed in some amazing outfits, who, which were quite colourful, and was just herself. And I, I think I, I took a lot of lessons from her. I've had some really good sponsors and um, a current I won't use names for some of these, but a current manager of um, a firm, a firm's branch in Victoria was one of my first mentors. And he, he used to um, throw me in the deep end with bits, which I loved because he, he would say, oh, can you leave this meeting or can you do this? And it really gave me room to grow. So really people who have um, let me, created opportunities for me to just jump in and help it. Doesn't, didn't matter what level I was at, but just to give things a go and learn. Um, have been had the most impact and influence, and I think people like Nigel um, in APMP ANZ have just 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 sharing their passion and and seeing that has been infectious. Really, it's um, you know if you if someone cares about something that deeply, it's it's really easy to get behind it. So yeah, I think that'd be the key people. Wow, you're surrounded by so many good-hearted people there. Your career mm. is super blessed. So. Yeah. What's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Um, probably just to not take it personally. You know, the, I think bidding, you're, you've often got people in these high pressure situations and with limited time and limited um, capacity to turn things around quickly. And um, there's, I've seen a, a little bit of ego creep in where people just don't want to share their tasks or they, they don't trust the bid professional in the room. Mm. Uh, I think it's just important not to take it that personally. Like I think at the beginning of my career, I was like, oh, don't you trust me? Why aren't I good enough? You know, trying to deal with that in a personal way. But I think um, as I've got older, it's just, it's important to remember it's, it's just work. Um, you know, people will have bad days and you just got to support them the best you can. That's beautiful advice. Other than that, is there any other advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? 
I think um, you can't really do this career without caring about it. So you so do it if you're passionate about some aspect of the career, um, whether that's writing or you just like to win or you like driving things or leading things. Um, it's not the sort of job that you can just have a nine to five career in and, and leave your work at the office. It will stay with you, whether you're working on things on, at night or not. Um, the problems of the day will creep back for you to solve um, at night as well. So just, yes, if, really pursue it if you're passionate about it. Wow. Super nice. So what's the best piece of advice you have received and from whom? Um, I think well, it's quite a lot of advice that have had some really good inputs over the years, but I think um, probably from a leadership style, it's just to hold, hold rubbish at arm's length. So don't, don't let things come too close to impact you when you're, you're um, addressing hard situations mm. and um, really just, you know, protect, protect your own heart, protect yourself in that process. So uh, I have been involved in a little bit of change management over the years, and I think that was um, some quite good advice. I think one of my, I think my first boss in Binning actually said something along the lines of, uh, um, "Don't worry about that. It's not worth your angst. It's not worth putting energy into into um, something that you can't really change or um, something beyond your control." So that was also good advice. Yes, definitely. So you know, multi-talented, multi-passionate, always curious. You know, you know, he's such a kind-hearted person. Kind of, know, what's next for you? Um, I don't really know. I think I just want to get through lockdown. But I think <laughs> career-wise, um, I'll be I'll be with Eric for a while. I'd say um, there's a lot to do here, and I, I'm really enjoying working with the team. Mm. Um, I think the long-term plan has always been to maybe go and work for myself in um, in bid writing. I'd like to be published with my creative work and, and maybe balance the two one day and really kick off the the creative career as well but um i think i'd I'd find it hard to say goodbye to bidding so i think i'll be in the industry for quite a while perfect is there any other book lined up uh yeah i've got i've got two on the go um so i've got a a historical fiction novel based on my family's ancestry from the uk but then i've also got a um a private investigator female private investigator led novel um, looking at a real case in Melbourne, but creating a fiction story from that. So, yeah, I've got to, uh, I think most writers will have several projects going on at once, but um, yeah, I've got two I need to finish. Yes, I think you need to, you need to have a female uh, investigative character, you know? Like yeah. All the guys, all the investigators for some reasons are males. Yeah, 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 I grew up reading the Dick Francis novels and I really liked that, that novel format and really liked those. But yeah, I think there are, some quite good um, female investigators out there. So that's the star of the, um, the third novel I'm working on. Oh, brilliant. That'd be great. So it's, is there anything else that you would like to share, Karina, or is there any part of your life or career that we missed it so that we could discuss in the last one or two minutes? I think we've covered a lot. I, think, I, feel, like this, I feel like this is, this is your life. Um, no, I think that's all. Thank you very much for having me. I, I just, um, I guess I just want to say I really appreciate this proposal community and um, it's always great meeting you know, all sorts of people from different backgrounds who come together and, and fall into this um, crazy industry. So no, thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure, Karina. It's a pleasure. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute privilege to have you with us at Scribble Talk. Wish you all the good health and happiness. Please do continue to inspire bid and proposal industry colleagues and everybody around you. Please be curious as you always do. Publish as many books and stay safe, stay healthy, stay kind. Thank you so much, Karina. Thanks again. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, Don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Sindram. Signing off.